now to help us focus on the fundamentals behind the technicals, the big run-up we've seen in the U.S. dollar. Phil Striebel, chief market strategist at Blue Line Futures, is with us this morning. Thanks to you, Phil, for sharing a very busy Friday morning with us. Let's talk about the dollar, the move up we've seen back to 104 this week, and what's it telling us? Yeah, 104. Well, it's telling us that we need to take an overseas vacation because our dollar is going to be stronger <laughs> than their foreign currency. So it might get some deals out there. It might feel pretty nice and cheap, at least the reprieve on uh, inflation for us. So uh, one thing I did throw up was a, a daily chart on the dollar index and overlaid a 200 day moving average. And it looks like we're running right up into that right now. So, you know, just a couple weeks ago, everyone was calling for the demise of the dollar. So it, it really tells you that it, it is the reserve currency and it really doesn't move too far. You know, it goes a little bit below 100, goes a little bit above 100, and we're kind of stuck here back and forth. Now, I know that seasonally, when you get into September, and, you know, Kevin was talking about the things that are coming on here in the next week and next two weeks out, if you buy the December euro currency, about the first week of September, the end of it, you hold it through mid um, September. It's gone up 12 out of the last 15 years. And then when you get into the back half of September, you tend to get seasonal weakness, especially in the Swiss franc and then also in the British pound. Swiss franc has sold off from about September 15th down to into October and into November, about 14 out of the last 15 years. So there is some seasonal strength early on and then weakness in the second half. Talk to me a little bit about uh, how this also, I mean, one could argue that the dollar's got some room to play catch up in terms of what we've seen as far as yields, right? I mean, other foreign currencies may be weighing on what we've seen or limited in terms of participation to the upside in terms of the greenback with some of the strength we've seen in the foreign currencies. But uh, yields have been kind of uh, charting the path forward for the greenback the whole way. Yeah, I'm really surprised. I mean, we're really going to look at what Jerome Powell is going to say. And then also at 2 p.m., you got Christine Lagarde. She's going to be speaking as well. So it could be a quite volatile session. I mean, yields have just been so resilient. I mean, it's got to be, I don't know how much higher it can go. It's going to be tough for, I was looking at the housing market, and they said back in 2020, um, with interest rates right near their low, like 2.5%, you know, someone with $2,500, they can afford a $750,000 house. Now you fast forward to where interest rates are right now. That same $2,500 payment will only get you about a $450,000 house. So a huge drop, almost like, you know, 40, 50%. Uh, drop on affordability, but you know yields, they're just so resilient. I'm really surprised that like some of these products like gold and silver and the precious metals are holding up um, given where we're at. Yeah, we're going to talk more about commodities later, but that's been one of the themes throughout the last couple of weeks on our show is really that the gold bulls should consider uh, gold holding up above 1900 at these levels just below 1950 in many ways a win considering what we're seeing here. Getting back to the U.S. dollar and yields financial markets here, I want to pull this chart because this really speaks to to uh, my point earlier, how the dollar does have some room to play catch up if we were to see the dollar back to levels, well, equivalent to where yields are right now. I mean, we'd be talking about 111, 112, 113. This, I'd imagine, uh, shifts attention here to uh, Christine Lagarde, right? Because we were talking earlier in the show, Phil, about how it's not just Powell. We're going to hear from the ECB president today as well. Yeah, that in the, the euro currency, it's really been a dog recently. I mean, it broke down pretty hard here today. Even the British pound is, mm -hmm. it had a kind of a, a devastating blow on, I think it was Wednesday night. And even the Swiss franc now is rolling over to a uh, bearish trend. So all the currencies, I mean, all the foreign currencies right now are bearish trend in trade. Only the dollar index is the bull one right now. I think you got to really sell every single rally that you get in all the foreign currencies at the moment. You know, unless you get some kind of stimulus out of China and it turns things around for the Australian dollar, it just doesn't, it just, it's not, a, it's not appealing right now uh, to be bullish on any foreign currency. You know, I just want to take a quick look here in terms of what Phil is speaking to as far as some of the weakness we've seen in the euro. Here it is. You can see the move lower from 113 down to 108. This is a big part of what's behind the move up here in the dollar. It yields as well, right? I mean, that's a factor, but we always look to the tail that wags the dog. The euro here, I've got the British pound headed your way. That's also another, well, the tail that wags the dog ultimately from 131 down to 126. Phil, it's somewhat counterintuitive, right? You've got a very aggressive tone still to come expected from Lagarde from, well, Bailey's not going to be there from the BOE, but uh, um, ultimately, I mean, these are the banks that are going to have to be a bit more aggressive still, yet currencies are coming off. One would think that the currencies would be rallying with expectations that they're going to have to continue to raise rates, but the idea being here that a higher rate environment actually dampens growth at some point is just going to weigh on economic conditions. 
That's the problem is when you go over to Europe, their economy is not, not as resilient, not as strong as the U.S. economy. So they look at, hey, they are going to have to pivot cut rates a little bit faster than mm-hmm. everyone else. So we're probably going to see, you know, that that weakness on that forward curve. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a couple of things to identify is that, you know, yields are at 22 year highs in the U.S. And then also the inverse correlation that a lot of people don't understand. The euro currency, again, it's against a it's a basket of currencies mm-hmm. against the U.S. dollar index. So as the euro currency weakens, it naturally boosts the dollar index. It's about 57 percent inversely correlated. So people got to keep an eye on that. It's not always necessary necessarily the underlying fundamentals of the currency itself, but also the correlation to the U.S. dollar. Uh, Phil, we were also talking uh, about expectations as we head into next week, right? I think it's important that we don't get tunnel vision. uh, And as we look forward, I would imagine, I mean, Powell's one of primary focuses has been labor conditions here in the U.S. as they remain tight. The primary I mean, I guess one could argue highlight there of the report is going to be the wages component and participation to see how that's faring amidst these conditions. Yeah, they've been, it's just been so strong. The, the labor market is absolutely resilient. You go over to like China where they stop reporting um, unemployment rates on, on younger people because it's just yeah. so bad over there. It's like 30, 40%. So over here, I'm still seeing like hiring signs everywhere. I mean, it seems like everyone, you know, the, everyone out here has a job. And I think that the labor market since COVID had really changed quite a bit, though, as far as the amount of people that are working, because people that normally would have to stay at home because maybe they have small children, things like that. Um, now those people are able to continue and maintain their job or even go out and get you know, a job and be aggressive about it. So I don't think that the labor market's going to break whatsoever um, on this. And I continue to see you know, stronger economic data. It's just how far is the Fed going to go before they, they realize that they are breaking things like the, uh, the housing market. You know, I want to uh, get a one last thought from here real quick, though. I want to speak to, since you brought China into Asia, Pacific currencies are also, I think, contributing what we've seen in terms of strength in the U.S. dollar, right? We've seen weakness in uh, China. We've seen weakness in Japan. Uh, Tokyo just had some CPI numbers out. It looks like that rate's stabilizing a little bit. Headline inflation slowed to 2.9 from 3.2 in July, peaked back in April at 3.5, below 3% for the first time since uh, fall of last year. But I'm looking at the currency, which continues to come under pressure. So there's a lot of uncertainty there, right? Whether you're talking about, you mentioned some of the other Asia Pacific currencies to keep an eye on as well a minute ago. But last thought here, because we were talking about some of the divergences, right, between dollar yields and some of the other these products that we watch, yields to the upside versus gold, which is faring pretty well. I keep looking at the indices, the NASDAQ. We just talked about the sell off yesterday. I wonder if this is start to something bigger, if we're finally coming to grips with this higher for longer environment in terms of tech, because the rallies have been short lived, but the sell offs are starting to become a bit more severe. And as I look, yields uh, where we were this time last year, uh, fall of last year, I should say, around 4.3 in the 10 year. I mean, the NASDAQ was significantly lower. It was down around 10,000 at this time last year. We're up around 15K. I mean, speak of a, a divergence and a bit of a disconnect there. If you could uh, uh, tell us your thought on that one, Phil. People really, I think they're starting to wake up to the reality and looking at their portfolios and saying, hey, the NASDAQ rallied 36% like in the first half of the year. The S&P was up 16. How much higher can it go? And they realize that, hey, the the effects of the Fed raising rates on the credit cycle and things like that could really weigh into the market. So it naturally makes sense. Divest yourself from some of these um, these markets, these equity markets that have done so well, go into and lock in longer term duration and things like that that are at 5%. I mean, I think it's just such a, such a wise move to rotate out of equities because um, the rug could be pulled out from underneath you and go into a safer yielding asset like the Treasury market. Yeah, I think uh, the sell off yesterday was significant. As I take a look at the daily time frame here in terms of the NASDAQ, it was, right? Because we were retesting the 50 day moving average off the highs for the year, 16,000. And ultimately, it does look like if we were to weaken here, uh, see some downside momentum here, further th- follow through, then we've got a bit of a head and shoulders pattern that just formed here uh, in the daily candle chart here. You can see again, and possibly a bit of a reversal off of VTOP at that high for the year. Appreciate you joining us here, Phil, and sharing part of your Friday morning with us. Uh, head of Fed F- F- Chair Jerome Powell's testimony to talk currencies and treasuries, Phil Strebel, joining us this morning from Blue Line Futures.